Here we go, here we go! It's time to start the 11th annual Dragon Ball Dissection December! For those of you who might not know, every year at this time I increase production of Dragon Ball Dissection episodes to an insane degree, pumping out five whole DVD videos across the month of December. Somehow I've managed to do this every year since 2013, but I never actually believe I'll pull it off. So if I come across as being in a constant state of PANIC, that's why. That's my little secret. So before we get started, I want to address something from the last video. I realize I wasn't as clear about something as I should have been. When I was talking about Vegeta Baby revealing himself to Trunks, I stated I had an issue with the inconsistency that Baby didn't simply take Trunks over when he had entered him several episodes before. And a lot of you said, Hey, maybe Baby didn't have that power then. N no, see, he did leave an egg in him that first time. That was my point, that it was an obvious retcon for Baby to say, Oh, actually, you had an egg in you all along, so there isn't a plot hole here. I just never did anything with it until this moment because it was all part of my plan to have a dramatic reveal. So basically, planting an egg in you was completely pointless and I could have just taken you over right here without changing the story in any way, which is basically what I'm doing anyway. It was a weird, sloppy, pointless attempt to patch over these incongruous elements, insisting we believe something that clearly didn't happen at the time, while simultaneously rendering it a meaningless bit of trivia. Where I screwed up was that I forgot to ever explicitly state that Baby did, in fact, say he'd left an egg in Trunks. And while I've long insisted this is Dragon Ball Dissection, not Dragon Ball Plot Synopsis, that's a rather necessary antecedent to leave out if I'm going to spend a few minutes dissecting it. So hopefully that makes sense now. Then again, making sense is not exactly on the menu as we have arrived at perhaps the weirdest part of Dragon Ball GT. If you remember, when we last left off, the stakes had risen in quite a dramatic fashion. Baby transformed into... <sighs> Baby transformed and seemingly killed Goku with his revenge death ball. So naturally, that means Goku has to play a board game for the next episode and a half. Welcome to Sugaroku Space, a never-before-mentioned purgatory-like environment that Goku finds himself in. Sugaroku literally means double six, which I presume refers to two dice? Even though this game primarily uses a single die, look, the name goes back a very long time and has actually been applied to multiple games in Japan. I think it's a legacy name that somewhat lost its literal meaning over time just because it's become so ingrained to a specific type of game. It's kind of like how Laverne and Shirley was still called that even after Shirley was no longer on the show. Or how Happy Days kept that name long after all the joy had been sucked out of it. So the short of it is, Sugaroku as it's applied here is basically what we'd call shoots and ladders. The first person to get to the end wins, you roll a die to move a certain number of spaces, after which you are at the mercy of whatever the space you landed on makes you do. It could be beneficial or detrimental to your progress. In other words, it's a game that is predicated on chance rather than skill. Goku meets up with the aptly named Sugaro, who challenges him to a game in order to get out of here. Either Goku wins and gets to return to his world, or he loses and dies for real. But Sugaro claims he has won 32,974,572 times in a row. And so begins the wacky shenanigans of traps and chants and riddles and games. Like so much of Dragon Ball GT, my feelings about this are... complicated? Dragon Ball has always been weird and silly. Dragon Ball's afterlife has always been especially silly. So the idea of Goku stuck in board game hell is both refreshingly new and also kind of in line with what we've seen before. It's so off the wall that I can't help but feel like this is something Toriyama would do. At the same time, though, it feels so off the point that its randomness might be a negative instead of positive. I think there are some issues with Dragon Ball being so well-worn and established by this point, it becomes harder to introduce brand new ideas without them feeling disconnected from what came before. I certainly don't want to discourage creativity. A lot of my issues with Dragon Ball Super come from how safe and familiar it often feels. But then you get the opposite extreme where, oh, by the way, board game world exists. I mean, Goku spent seven whole years dead, 
You'd think he'd have heard about this place at some point, right? Even so, I can't help but find joy in just how much English is on display in this casino vomit of topography. Let me just share a few of my favorites. Haven? Are you ready? And best of all, big or small? You'd swear these were written by 21st century internet memes. Kibito Kaioshin explains that he managed to warp Goku out of the way of the revenge death ball before it hit him, but his teleport was interrupted by the large concentration of energy knocking Goku into this dimension that even the Kaioshin have no jurisdiction over. So, that's very little explanation that requires us to accept a lot at once. Teleportation can be interrupted? Okay, sure, I guess. Despite Sugodoku space being compared to the River Sanzu, Goku actually isn't dead or near death because he never actually got hit by the death blow, but he still ended up in a purgatory by sheer coincidence? I, I guess it was on the way? Is it even technically a purgatory at all, or is it a living physical location? It seems to want to be both and neither, and we just kind of wave a hand over and eh. But it is still fun. Sugodoku is a fun trickster character. This section of the story is funny. I enjoy seeing Goku struggle with riddles and force himself not to cry and eventually figure out the secret of this place all on his own. I love the riddle where he's asked to name a chestnut, Kuri, that is surprised. The answer is Bikuri, which means surprised. But since Goku is stupid when it comes to wordplay, he blurts out the only Kuri he knows. Kuririn. That's hilarious. And then he gets so flustered he gives Vegeta for the next answer despite it having no connection to the riddle he's asked. Goku has to get through a challenge without crying. It falls back on that old gag of cutting onions. Then it falls back even harder on Goku's fear of needles. But the giant needle is presented by Chi-Chi dressed up as a nagging nurse berating him for not having a job. Not only is that hilarious, I am now convinced this is something they roleplay at home. This memory had to come from somewhere. Goku is into naughty nurses, physical pain, and being shamed, and only Dragon Ball GT has the guts to reveal Goku's kinks. I'm not terribly happy with how this gag ends, though. Not only does Goku somehow manage to suck his tears back into his eyes, it's accompanied by a straw slurping sound effect. I'm not sure why, but I find that so incredibly gross. It's just... Icky. That's all fun, but on the flip side, it's hard to be too invested in Goku struggling through a game of chance. Putting a hero into a dangerous situation is exciting because the hero has to get out of it through strength or skill or cunning. There's not a lot of that in a game of shoots and ladders. It's all literally a roll of the dice. The challenges at least require some skill on Goku's part, but ultimately all he accomplishes before the game ends is not being impaled on some spikes, and straw slurping his own tears. I mean, it's worse than that because we find out even the chance part is being rigged in Sugudo's favor through a die he controls. Sugudo gets all the breaks, and Goku gets the shaft. This is ultimately an exercise in Goku having things done to him. That renders him largely passive, which is not nearly as interesting as it could be. But, the die being rigged is ultimately instrumental in Goku figuring out what's being done to him. Goku accidentally drops the die in a pit of lava directly under his space, and when the die reacts in pain to that and refuses to be dropped again, Goku realizes the die is actually sentient and following Sugoro's wishes. It's not a lot for Goku to figure out, but it's something. I'm just surprised it took Goku to figure this out. Surely other players have gone through these lava spaces as well. It seems not only possible this same scenario would have played out in the past, but highly unlikely the die wouldn't have ended up falling off this tiny space every single time. Eh, whatever. So the truth of the matter is that the die is Sugoro's son, Su Kogoro. They're actually both shape-shifting space tanuki who got trapped here somehow. Okay, look, remember that joke in Dragon Ball Z Abridged where Jis is from Space Australia? Apparently, real Dragon Ball beat them to the punch by over a decade with Space Tanuki. Anyway, they were told they had to win 540,000 games in a row to get out of here. Given that Sugudo earlier bragged he'd already won 32,974,572 games in a row, 
I guess he was either lying then or the writers forgot. Either one is fairly plausible in these circumstances, so I'm willing to accept the trickster character was lying to psych out his competition. Goku expresses sympathy for them. Given the nearly unwinnable circumstances they were put into, I can certainly understand why they cheated. Still, I feel like the show kind of glosses over the fact that they willingly chose to damn thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to eternal punishment or whatever happens here just to save their own skins. The revelation that they cheated gets the attention of their victims, I think, and they get their revenge by destroying the place. Breaking into or out of Sugoroku space might be too much even for the gods of the gods, but those piddly little gods don't have the GT Kamehameha, which, as we've already established, can do anything. So with just one blast, Goku and the space Tanuki are free, allowing Kibito Kaioshin to swoop in and take them to the Kaioshin realm. And there, Goku is going to train with the elder Kaioshin by... grinding coffee. In terms of the training, random continues to be the name of the game as it seems a little random, even for Dragon Ball. Yes, the elder Kaioshin's previous training involved him sitting around for hours reading manga and dancing. The joke there is that it appears that he isn't doing anything but is actually in the middle of a sacred ritual. Here, we find out he's trying to get Goku's tail to grow back and he does this by making Goku grind coffee, which makes his butt itchy. I don't get it. Usually if there's something that doesn't work for me, my viewers are quick to point out some cultural context they think I'm missing, which I'm usually not. I just think it's flawed storytelling and the context doesn't make a difference. But in this case, I actually am wondering if there's some context I'm missing that would make this make sense. Is there a Japanese legend about monkeys grinding coffee? I don't know. Also, I didn't know this until listening to Konzenshu the podcast just before I wrote this, but Kaioshin, the young one, has a different voice actor in GT than he did in Dragon Ball Z. I never noticed that. But yeah, Mitsuya Yuji, his original voice actor, is gone, replaced by Ota Shinichiro. They'd jump back and forth over the years. Mitsuya returned for Kai, but Ota played him in Super, and I honestly can't tell the difference, and I don't think that's ever happened before. So, yeah, clearly he does a good job. So with Goku's quest, we now have two new characters who were just kinda around for the rest of the arc. This is another one of those things that caused me all kinds of confusion when I saw the end of this arc as a teenager. I had no idea who these weird little things were. And it really doesn't matter. Like so many Dragon Ball characters, they serve one function and then just kind of take up space. Don't get me wrong, I like Sugoro and Sukogoro well enough as one-offs. But like Upa and Bora, they don't really need to just hang around. And it's especially galling given how late in the story we are to be introducing new characters like this. But here they are. One complaint I certainly won't level at Sugoroku Space, though, is that it messes up the pacing. While I've certainly made it come across this way by handling it all at once, the baby story does not stop for this. It's just something Goku has to do while that story continues. It is obviously another iteration of the tried and true Dragon Ball fight structure, getting Goku out of the way so other characters can fail while he's gone. Eh, fun. Strictly speaking, you could remove all of this, have Kaioshin successfully transport Goku to the Kaioshin realm the first time, and nothing really changes. But would you really rather have another two episodes of cutaways to Goku tediously grinding coffee? I sure as hell wouldn't. I don't think Sugoroku space goes on for too long. If anything, it ends far more abruptly than I would have expected given how much focus it's given in its first episode. Pretty much as soon as Goku discovers the trick, it's over. But it does come away feeling like filler in a show that technically doesn't have any. If cutting this out, however, resulted in more space for Pond to fight back on Earth, I probably would have advocated for that. So back on Earth, Baby's followers line up to his floating throne to present to him the Dragon Balls. And yeah, it's the GT Dragon Balls. It's weird to me the regular ones never come up. You'd think in the two months that Baby has been taking over the Earth and having literally every person at his disposal, he could have just used those rather than waiting on Goku and the others to come back to Earth, but whatever. Baby summons Shenlong and asks to create a new version of his home planet. And Shenlong does that. He places it right next to Earth. Baby decides to call this new planet, Planet Sufru. 
Now, there was a bit of a confusion a few episodes ago wherein Baby mistakenly referred to the old planet Vegeta as Planet Sufru when it was actually called Planet Plant, but they seem to have it straightened out now. Baby refers to this planet as Planet Tsufuru, and it's clear why he chooses it. Plant is a very neutral name. The Saiyans and Sufurians are both plant people. Changing the name to Vegeta reflected the new Saiya dominance. Naturally, naming it Tsufuru establishes this new version as a Tsufurian haven. Topographically, I actually kind of like it. Its skies are an ominous color, and while it is full of craggy mountains just itching to be blasted and knocked into during the upcoming fight, it does come equipped with cities and architecture, presumably replicas of the dead Sufurian civilization. So while it does primarily exist as a battleground, there's at least a little more to it. And that's more than I can say for, say, Planet Namek. Pon witnesses the wish from a distance and breaks down. It's a really sad moment, Pon realizing that all their hard work was in vain, as the Earth is now in danger again. Girl, you have no idea. And I really love this development. It's not a problem that all of their work over the past 30 episodes has been for nothing. It further adds to the hopelessness. And they met Baby in space, on their adventure. This is not some random outcome. It's the heroes hitting their lowest point in spite of their best efforts to stop it. It's too bad the impact of all of that is severely diminished by a really weird musical placement choice. This is so not the time for the wacky music to be playing. I don't know what they were thinking. Pon finds the remains of Giru, who admittedly looks a little bit better than the last time we saw him, but is still functionally broken. She puts him in her backpack and reclaims her bandana. Yes, girl means business now. This is her Bardock moment. Let's just hope I'm not inspiring some treacly fanfiction where Great Granddad shows up to give her support. The first order of business is to sneak aboard Bluma's giant spaceship to go with everyone to Planet Tsufuru. Jeez, Baby is huge compared to her, despite the fact that he's Vegeta. Uh, here's another thing I need to clear up from last time. A lot of you seem to think I don't like Baby's design because he doesn't look enough like Vegeta. No, I said I don't like Baby's design, and I don't like that he doesn't look like Vegeta. Those are two separate thoughts. I don't like Baby's design because it's hideous. The hair looks like there's something about Mary. I hate the color combination of red, black, and yellow. The whole thing looks like a hardcore 90s comic threw up all over the place. It looks like he should be named Cable, or Aluminum Steel, or Extreme Despair. All he needs is a bandolier and a couple of dozen cargo pockets. Oh, and some mirrored sunglasses to go over his mirrored eyes. There. You might not like it, but you can't honestly say I've made it any worse. This isn't a fashion extravaganza. It's a fashion execution. A mercy killing. So this is where we get to that scene I mentioned last time where Boo, with Pon and Satan in tow, dons a disguise to get in line for the trip to Planet Sufru. Last time, I talked about how neither Kuririn nor any of the other people in line pick up on the fact that Mr. Boo is not one of Baby's minions. But what's just as weird is that nobody seems to pick up on the fact that they know each other. Despite it having been shown that established bonds persist, both with Goku's family over the past several episodes, as well as Kuririn's family here, Kuririn doesn't recognize Mr. Boo, Bluma doesn't recognize Kuririn, or seemingly Kame Senin and Gumo, for that matter. There's just no end to the weirdness here. Anyway, because Mr. Boo cuts Kuririn off in line and Bluma cuts off the line right after Mr. Boo, that means that Kuririn is not going and is once again spurned by his family for being a sad little failure. But consider this judgmental family. If Mr. Boo hadn't cut him in line, Bluma would have cut the line at Kuririn, meaning that Kuririn and Kuririn alone would have gone to Planet Sufru without you. So him being a pushover was actually the best thing that could have happened to you. But, hey, nice to see you, Kuririn, even if you are a confusing, inconsistently kind zombie dad. Now that Pan, Mr. Satan, and Mr. Boo are on planet Sufru, they discuss how they're going to fix things. Pan, however, has a plan. Operation Brown Pants. She brought along a teeny tiny bottle of laxatives. She's going to force feed them to all of Baby's followers, after which they will poop out all the eggs and go back to normal. And that's possible due to another randomly applied rule of Baby's followers. When someone gets their attention, they will look up into the sky with their mouths hanging open like drowning turkeys, meaning Pon can literally just throw them in. This is after their switches are flipped to evil upon seeing one of Baby's enemies, something that definitely has not happened before now, even in this episode. 
This plan is ridiculous for a multitude of reasons, but the show is clearly aware that it is. Even Mr. Satan thinks this is a bad idea. There's the issue of scale. How many laxatives could she possibly have? There's the issue that presumes that none of these people have pooped in two months. And then there's the issue that if this had actually worked, if the villain's plan was actually stopped by laxatives, this is literally the only thing anybody would remember Dragon Ball GT for. And I'm honestly not sure if that's a bad thing. But the show clearly knows this is a little kid plan fueled by little kid logic. Well, I'd believe that a bit more strongly if not for the whole drowning turkey thing and hammer space pill materialization making me think it might have been plausible. People even start doubling over moments after swallowing the pills, so maybe I'm giving this too much credit. Regardless, Videl steps in to put a stop to Operation Brown Pants. She and Gohan confront her, smack her around a bit. It's really uncomfortable to watch, but also really good drama. And don't forget, just a few episodes ago, they tried to play what was essentially the same dynamic as forced comedy. I'm glad they've realized that this is what villains do to make themselves come across as more villainous. Pan is just really good in these episodes, still plucky but also vulnerable, unable to truly process her parents treating her this way. Because of that innate loyalty and affection, she can't defend herself. Thankfully, she doesn't have to. Oob is here! Yes, after 30 episodes, he's finally returned to the story. I'm sure it's going to be worth the wait and not a complete waste of time and character. Or characters. Randomness aside, these are really good episodes. There's a lot of charm here, from Sugoroku space to Pan silliness being appropriate rather than grating. Mr. Satan and Mr. Boo, as always, make a great team and help keep the mood light. And there's plenty of momentum on Baby's end as he furthers his own objectives. Things are definitely gearing up for a final confrontation. And we'll continue on with that next week as Dragon Ball Dissection December continues. Remember that you can see that next episode right now as a $10 and up patron. It's already there. Patrons are watching it right now. But I'm speaking from the past, so I don't really know what it is they're seeing. I hope they're liking it. I hope I'm being witty and sublime, but I really don't know. The causality of YouTube video releases is confusing even to me, and I live it. But rest assured, that's what they're doing right now, and you can too. I would really, really appreciate your support, whether it's contributing to see the video early, or simply engaging with this video so that YouTube rewards me with treats. Regardless of when it is, though, I will see you next time!